Yeah. All right. Oh, it's so nice to have four of us. Uh, okay. Here we are. So yesterday, um, yesterday we dealt with some uh, some exotic terrain. Yesterday we, we introduced this idea that the Farallon plate beginning 200 million years ago, uh, sort of acted like a conveyor belt. Um, and as a result of that conveyor belt, yeah, it, whoops, the idea is that it wasn't just ocean crust that North America was moving over. We had this concept of if this is North America and this is Farallon, North America and Farallon are moving toward one another. Farallon is subducting beneath North America, but we've got all of these, I called them gumdrops of uh, land riding on top of the Farallon plate, and as Farallon subducts, these chunks of land, you can think of them like islands, these chunks of land, uh, they don't subduct, they smash onto the edge of North America, making the North American continent bigger. So this is, this is the basic concept we want for the last 200 million years, or at least a portion of the last 200 million years. Um, and this is, this is all of the west coast of North America, okay? This is, this is Oregon, this is California, this is British Columbia, this is Alaska. Uh, and that is what the diagram on 43 is attempting to show us. Uh, so, today what we're going to do is we're going to take this concept, we're going to take this, this big picture, um, and however you want to think of it, if it's the conveyor belt at the grocery store, and I kind of like that one because we can, you can actually see your groceries kind of scraping off the edge of the conveyor belt at the store, um, this is the, the big concept we want, and today what we're going to do is we're going to basically build Washington State. Uh, we're going to build our home uh, from the ground up. And there's a diagram on the next page uh, that's 44, if you're counting, um, labeled Exotic Terrains of Washington. Pretty simple diagram. Most of the diagrams in this book are pretty simple. Um, because I'm trying to keep the trying to keep it uh, something manageable, you know. Uh, so maybe we'll do this as uh, a little timeline. We'll do this as a series of events. Um, and it's going to start 200 million years ago. 200 million years ago, that's a significant date for us. That's when Pangea splits up. When North America begins uh, journeying across the Farallon Plate. So Pangea is going to split. North America is going to start heading west. At the time that North America starts heading west, the coast, the beach, was in a very different spot. Uh, we alluded to this yesterday. The coast of North America at the time 
was um, say Vegas, Salt Lake City, and Spokane all had oceanfront property. Well, it's 200 million years ago, so there's nobody to own this oceanfront property except for some dinosaurs and uh, miscellaneous small mammals. Uh, but if you got in a time machine and you took your surfboard and you wanted to go surfing uh, 200 million years ago, you would go to Vegas, Salt Lake City, or Spokane to do that. So at this time, uh, 200 million years ago, this becomes an active plate boundary. Prior to that, it was not an active plate boundary. So what does that mean? Active plate boundary. Meaning we had subduction of ocean crust, feral on plate, underneath continental crust, When we subduct ocean crust between continental crust, we get composite cone volcanoes. This is this is uh, using the relationships and patterns that we know. But if Spokane's at the coast, that puts our composite cone volcanoes a hundred miles east of Spokane. That puts our composite cone volcanoes in Montana present-day Montana. So this is this is the beginning of the beginning of the conveyor belt. Alright. Uh, Washington is going to gain its first significant chunk of real estate. Um, and I'm, here I'm gonna try to duplicate this diagram. Something like that, close enough. Um, Washington is going to gain its first significant chunk of real estate, 175 million years ago. Uh, oh, here's here's the uh, that's Craton right there. So Spokane is up here. And the first little piece that we are going to add on is called the Kootenay Arc. Kootenay Arc. Now, we have to be a little bit careful here because when we talk about accreted terrains, when we talk about accreted terrains, uh, there are two ages. I will use blue. Uh, I'm going to try to stick with some color coding through this thing. Um, there is the age of the rock, and there is the age of accretion. Accretion means adding on. We should uh, let's make sure that we know that. Accretion means adding on. So the age of accretion is not the age of the rock, okay? The Kootenay arc, the, the actual rock, the actual material is much older because it had to exist before it could get slapped onto the side of the continent. So this is the first gumdrop that, that uh, we encountered on our conveyor belt across the Farallon Plate is the Kootenay Arc. 
This word arc should give you a clue. Arc is usually used to talk about volcanoes. The Kootenay Arc is an ancient uh, chain of arc volcanoes. And uh, we got lucky enough to uh, have it smashed the edge of the 175 years. So what's this going to do? Remember, we have mm, about orange. We have composite cones 200 million years ago over here in Montana. And this is the edge of the craton. This is the edge of the continent right here. As we add the Kootenay arc, we move our subduction zone west which means we're going to move our arc volcanoes west as well. So the whole scene sort of starts to shift to the west 175 million years ago. Uh, next up, we don't have to wait long. Next up is called the Okanagan terrain. Okanagan terrain, and this is a larger piece than uh, the Kootenai. This is, it's bigger than the Kootenai. And that thing shows up about 150 million years ago. Again, the rock is much older, but 150 million years ago, we add the Okanagan to it. So it's bigger than the Kootenai. And this is really old material. It's like pre-Cambrian. There is some of it that is pre-Cambrian. So old stuff. And the thing I want to point out about it being old pre-Cambrian rock is if we're thinking, if we're thinking of these, these gumdrops, these big blobs of, of stuff, sitting on an ocean plate. It's kind of tempting to think of something like Hawaii. That's a big blob of rock sitting out in the middle of an ocean plate. Hawaii is volcanic material, though. Hawaii is young. If we're adding Precambrian material, this is more evidence that it was actually torn off of another continent transported somehow across the ocean or up the coast and then added on to Washington State, 150 million years ago. So let's see, I'm getting ahead of myself, 175. Kootenay Arc. Igneous, old. I don't have ages for you there, but it is definitely older than 175. 150, we get our Okanagan terrain. Which is much older. Back to the Precambrian, some of it, not all of it. And this Precambrian, remember, this is evidence that we are from another continent. It's from a continent. It's not something that just sprouted on the ocean floor like Hawaii sitting on top of the Hawaiian house. Um, so, of course, as the Okanagan terrain accretes, the date of accretion, about 150, our coast moves west again, and our volcanoes move west again. 
The whole thing moves west. Um, now, it's worth pointing out. I, I should point this out. Uh, both in your diagram in your pink book, as well as the diagram I'm drawing on the board, which is trying to mimic that, I'm putting these little dotted lines here. Because we know the CRB is... Those are 17 to 6 million years old. This is much younger stuff. The Columbia River basalt is much younger than all of this. When you did your Washington State geologic map, we had our little green islands down south of Spokane. This is Craton material. This is Precambrian Craton material sticking up through this younger flood basalt. <clears throat> so there is stuff going on underneath the CRBs. We just don't know exactly what it is. I mean, here in Tri-Cities, it's three miles thick. It's kind of hard to say whether it's Okanagan terrain or maybe it's some Kootenai under there or maybe it's something else. Maybe it's a, another one that nobody even knows about. So we're talking about northern Washington because that's the part we can see. Uh, okay, I'm going to now grossly generalize. And we're going to call this next thing the North Cascades terrain. I'm going to put it in quotes. Because that part of the patchwork quilt is particularly difficult. It's really, it's, it's especially tough. Uh, the North Cascade, there's people today working on their PhDs trying to unravel what we're calling the North Cascades terrain. It's very complicated. It's very jumbled up. So we're going to treat it as one whole thing and not really touch it very much. Um, we're going to call everything from the Okanagan terrain to Seattle North Cascades terrain. We need a date for that. We actually need a range of dates for that. They say 150 to 80 million years. So we have a range for the North Cascades terrain because it's not actually a single terrain. It's a lot of little pieces. Um, but a 101 class is just, we're, we're just not there. We don't have the tools to unravel that. We do have one tool, though, and um, and I think this is uh, kind of worth diving into a little bit. And that one tool that we have is that yesterday I used Mount Stewart as an example. Uh, how about a different color? Got new ink in all my pens yesterday. I'm gonna make this color. Mount Stewart is right about here. Mount Stewart is right about there. And remember, we said we had an age for Mount Stewart that was 93 million years old. That's the age of the rock, not the age of accretion. That rock of Mount Stewart, that granite batholith, cool, 93 million years ago. We have really good absolute age dates for this. Well, if the North Cascades terrain accreted between 150 and 80, that only leaves about a 13 million year window between Mount Stewart cooling 
in Mexico and making its way up the coast to Washington State and getting placed accreted to Washington State. So we've got a we've got a between ages of accretion for this stuff and an absolute age for Mount Stewart. Uh, we've got a, a pretty good window of time for when Mount Stewart was on the move, when that battleit was on the move. Okay. So this is um, this is most of the state. Eighty million years ago, Seattle was ocean front property. Dinosaurs weren't extinct yet. That happened sixty six. Um, however, we don't have any dinosaur bones in Washington State. Um, anyway, Seattle was the coast. 80 million years ago, and um, we only have one more major piece. We only have one more major piece to stick onto the edge, and that is what is labeled as the Olympic Peninsula. And we already kind of know some of the story about the Olympic Peninsula, right? We've got this subduction complex. We're scraping a bunch of sediment and, and, and ocean floor mud and stuff up onto the edge of the continent. We're building Mount Olympus and all of that. Uh, but the Olympic Peninsula can also be thought of as an accreted terrain. We've got a date for that, too. 50 million years ago, we add the last piece of Washington State. 50 million years ago, the Olympic Peninsula docks onto the edge of the continent. So this whole time, we're cruising across the Farallon Plate, right? The whole time, we're picking up gumdrop after gumdrop after gumdrop. This North Cascades thing, that's almost 30 different gumdrops. Um, and you might remember we said that Mount Stewart, 93 million years old, formed in Mexico, made its way up here. Lots of the stuff in the North Cascades terrain has that same story. It actually accreted, added on, to Mexico, and then was torn off and brought up the coast to uh, to the Pacific Northwest. And you know, if you look uh, if you look back at the ugly black and white diagram on forty three, and kind of look at the shapes of of the the different accreted terrains, you'll notice that. They're all kind of spread out south to north. They kind of look like they've been smeared northwards, drug northwards, and stretched out. That's part of this whole migration of, of land mass from Mexico up to North America or up to the Pacific Northwest. Um, okay, I got ahead of myself again. Um, you go ahead. 150 to 80. North Cascades. Terrain.
So I'm trying to do this graphically and in sort of a nice orderly list. Um, 30 plus different pieces. And then finally 50, we get the Olympic Peninsula. So starting 50 million years ago, Washington State looks kind of like it looks today. Of course, it looks different because 50 million years ago, we didn't have any CRBs, right? We didn't have any Columbia River basalts. But you'll remember from our Cascades Volcanoes lecture, we had three answers for how old the Cascade Volcanoes were, right? Our first answer was 200 million years ago because that's when our active plate boundary started. That's when subduction starts. But our coast was at Vegas, Salt Lake City, and Spokane, so the volcanoes 200 million years ago were way further inland than they are today. Our shortest answer for how old the Cascade volcanoes are is 2 million years, right? Because 2 million years, that's the lifespan of an individual composite cone volcano. And our middle answer was 40 million years. And maybe this, and this timing should start to make sense. If the Olympic Peninsula added on 50 million years ago, then our volcanoes are migrating westward up until shortly after this happens. And 40 million years, they stop their westward migration and they, the Cascade Volcanic Arc sits where it sits today. So shouldn't we have, shouldn't we have a bunch of ghost volcanoes around here? Shouldn't we be able to see Shouldn't we be able to, to date the ages of ghost volcanoes as they move westward? Well, yeah, except for the fact that they're all sitting underneath Columbia River basalts. We've got, I'm certain that there are ghost volcanoes underneath the Columbia River basalts old cores of old composite cone volcanoes that are maybe 150 million years old or 100 million years old, but the Columbia River basalts covered them all. So at this point, that's all kind of just conjecture. And you know, maybe, maybe someday uh, Somebody would be drilling a deep well or something and, and happen to drill into one of these things and it'll add a piece of data to this story. We, don't, we just don't have the data right now. Um, okay, let me, let me see here. So let's, let's do this uh, with this North Cascades terrain. I know it's I know it's the piece right in the middle. I'm saving I'm saving the Olympic Peninsula for tomorrow because that's got its own interesting story as well. And that once we get to the Olympic Peninsula, we're uh, we're going to pivot and we're going to really start putting together a regional story from all kinds of pieces of evidence that we've touched on throughout, the, throughout this quarter. And we'll put together a regional story that hopefully will, I don't know, it still blows my mind. Hopefully it kind of blows your mind. I think it's really cool. Uh, but I have 10 minutes left. And so I think I want to focus on the North Cascades here, North Cascades terrain and uh, spend a little bit more time with that. I've alluded, I've talked a little bit about this Mexico thing. So 
say all these North Cascades rocks came up from Mexico. Mount Stewart came up from Mexico. So, how do we know? So the first really compelling piece of evidence here is called paleomagnetic data. Um, and here's the concept. The Earth has a magnetic field. And Earth's magnetic field has a specific shape. So if this is the Earth, the, the magnetic field looks like this. Kind of apple shaped. And Magnets are weird, and I'm not even going to pretend to be able to explain magnets. Uh, this is south, this is north. Uh, but basically, there's, there's pushing magnetic force and there's pulling magnetic force. And all the penguins down in, south, uh, down in Antarctica are doing the pushing. And Santa Claus up here in the North Pole is doing all of the pulling. And... All the magnets on Earth, this is why a compass works, all the magnets on Earth uh, can align themselves, all magnetic things can align themselves to that magnetic field if they are allowed to move freely. <coughs> Igneous rocks have magnetic particles, microscopic magnetic particles. So you can think of it like the needle in a compass. You know, you hold the compass and you move it around and the needle in the compass moves back and forth to align with magnetic north. When an igneous rock is melted, when it is liquid, all those little magnetic particles align themselves because it's liquid, so they can move freely. All of those particles align themselves to magnetic north. And when the rock hardens, it locks those little particles in place. So every igneous rock actually is a record of Earth's magnetic field in the location where it formed. And so some very smart Geophysicists can tell, they can measure these rocks and tell what latitude, in other words, how far from the equator they were by the orientation of these magnetic particles. So here by the equator, the orientation might look like that, whereas up here by the North Pole, the orientation might look like that. And down by the South Pole, the orientation would look like that. So this paleomagnetic signal for Mount Stewart says that it formed, without any doubt, very close to the equator. So that's what the geophysicists tell us, Mount Stewart, that is. Uh, so the geophysicists say, well, data says it formed close to the equator. And then it's up to the structural geologists to figure out, okay, well, if that's true, then how in the hell did something that big make its way up to the Pacific Northwest? How in the hell did something that big migrate thousands of miles? And um, all of this to say, the history, of course, is much more complex than we're making it here. Uh, but 
you get the dates right, 85 to 60. Uh, all of this northward movement of stuff in the North Cascades terrain. Northward movement is confined to a specific period of time from 85 to 60 million years. From 85 to 60 million years, there is a steady northern migration of pieces of land from Mexico up to the Pacific Northwest, British Columbia, and even to Alaska. So how could this be? Isn't the story that the Farallon plate is moving to the west, or moving to the east, and North America is moving to the west? That is the story. That's the story we've been using. As it turns out, I lied to you. And it's a little bit more complex. We have two ocean plates. We have North America. And we have spreading center. Farallon and another plate which no longer exists anymore called the Kula Plate. And our Kula Plate has some northward component to its motion. And the story goes. that the Kula plate, which no longer exists, remnants of it, geologists, uh, geophysicists have found remnants of the Kula plate underneath North America. But the story goes, and I should probably, I think I got my angles wrong a little bit. Uh, North America is actually overtaking two tectonic plates. One of them is the Kula plate, and the Kula is what's providing our northward motion. And the Kula is what is carrying all of this stuff up the coast of North America. Just a little teaser, because we're gonna we're gonna make this uh, gonna fill this in a little bit more in the coming days. But um we actually have two tectonic plates, uh, and 85 to 60, Kula is dragging stuff north. The idea is that about 60 million years ago, uh, no, not 60, a little bit later than that, but um, eventually North America overtakes the entire Kula plate, and it becomes just a North America parallel plate story, which we'll pick up tomorrow. I hope you guys have a wonderful afternoon. By the way, homework number four uh, is available in Google Classroom, uh, as well as homework number five. Homework number six will go live on Monday. Um, there are still labs that I'm working on grading, and we'll get into the grade book either today or tomorrow. And um, let's finish it off. Have a great day. I'm going to